it's Steve from Brownells with a special edition of From the Vault. And with me today is Joel Colander from Rock Island Auction House in Rock Island, Illinois. And we have Bobby Tyler of Tyler Gunworks in Friona, Texas, Master Gunsmith. And I needed these guys with me today because if you haven't recognized it already, we've got something really special for you. Joel, what do we got? Uh, this is what in 1929 was unveiled as, uh, as the last word. This is Elmer Keith's number five custom Colt revolver. This is the gun. This is the gun. It's, uh, it's actually, of course, uh, we have it because it's coming up for sale in our uh, September 10th to 12th premier firearms auction. Um, we're calling it a celebration of legends just because of the collections that are in it, but also in no small part because of Mr. Keith's revolver. Right, this has a whole legend built around it. It is a one of one revolver. So, often copied, but never duplicated. Um, what's the actual history behind this gun? I know it went through a lot of stuff to get to where it is. It did indeed. So, um, Elmer Keith, a, a young gun writer for American Rifleman, and he would write quite a bit about his feats with a revolver. Uh, long distance shots, hunting, things like that, and touting his expertise. And a person who was <coughs> reading those articles and was a little bit skeptical <laughs> was Harold Croft, and who was no um, he's not fresh to the business, shall we say, uh, an experienced gunsmith in his own right. And so uh, there was some uh, correspondence and a long story short, Elmer Keith said um, that Croft brought to him in uh, Durkee uh, a suitcase full of revolvers. Yeah. As Croft wanted to find out if Elmer Keith was really all about what he was writing about, or if he was, uh, or if he was spinning some fiction, shall we say? And he rode the train all the way from Pennsylvania to Oregon, which in those days was not a uh, quick journey. Not a luxury trip. No, <laughs> no, probably three or four days at least. So he got there, and they spent some time, and um, he, uh, they, they found out, like I said, Elmer Keith was was the real deal behind the revolvers. Um, he actually brought in that suitcase of revolvers four of his own custom designs. Harold Croft had. Uh, numbered them one through four. They were for a lot of um, quick draw for self-defense type guns. Uh, and Elmer Keith liked those. He liked a lot of them because they weren't the off-the-shelf Colts. They addressed a lot of uh, the issues or, or things that weren't quite perfect about the single action armies or the Bisleys uh, of the day. And so it didn't it didn't take him, I don't believe, a year before he had a list of, uh, of specifications that he would like in a firearm and he got together with Croft and got together with Sedgley and a couple other uh, notable gunsmiths of the time and created the next one which he uh, they called the number five sort of in honor of Croft's uh, previous four custom revolvers. Right and Bobby you know that uh, this gun borrows a little bit from each of those four revolvers that he saw when Croft came out to visit him but he added some of his own touches too and the way it was put together um, well obviously we're still talking about it today. We are, it's, it's actually, uh, it's the brainchild behind a lot of what we do today. It's, uh, like we said, it's, it's been copied but never mimicked. Um, it's a platform. Uh, it is. On, in, today's, in today's society, it's considered the platform and uh, there's so many different spins to take off of that. Uh, this revolver is no, uh, it's no stranger to any of the build, the custom, and you can go any direction you want. You could, you can take and say, hey, this is the number five. Uh, this is how they all have to be. But the beauty part of it is, is we take ideas and we take things and we, you know, Croft did this and we look at it and say, wow, you know, the way, what they had to work with back then. These guys, exactly. this, now this guy was talented. He was a craftsman uh, of craftsmen. But we take and we say, well, you know, we're going to take this part of it and introduce it into a build and put this spin on it and that spin on it. But the baseline idea, this is the brainchild. What do you think gave him the most trouble building this gun? My opinion would be the, the undercut latch area and the hammer would have been right. the most difficult uh, upon a pretty in-depth inspection. You'll notice where the hammer, right, right in the area uh, behind the spur here, has been dovetailed yeah. and built in. Yeah. And I'm going to say it was probably done by hand. I'm sure it was you back know. then. 
but they had to take two hammers and build one basically they to get did. the shape he wanted. So once they dovetailed that in, they went in and, and welded that up right. and recut it back out. And I had to look pretty hard to find, I mean, it's brilliantly masterly done. Speaking of welding, that top strap's been extended toward the back and made a complete flat top all the way across um, with a torch. Right. And not only was the welding good, but the cleanup work was excellent. What you'll see is the when it's set up for this target sight system, uh, a couple of things I'll point out. So when the barrel was, was built for it, it was actually set back. That, about that first inch of the front sight has been turned down, mm -hmm. and a band, including that front sight, swedged on there, pinned, and balanced with this rear target sight. Right. And it was basically, in, in this day and age, it was the ultimate target setup. Mm -hmm. um, the number five grip frame, what we lean on today, and what we campaign on in all of our builds, and uh, is, is the way it accepts recoil. Right. In yeah. fact, some guns you don't want to build on anything but a, a like a number five or a Bisley type grip frame, so well, you can handle it. That's that's exactly that recoil and the way it recovers, and the way your eyes go back to the sights and mm -hmm. get right back on your target for the next shot is so important in a say a hunting scenario. Which, why do you think that was built? You right. think it was built to sit in a gun safe? Oh man. And at some point, Bill Ruger must have gotten a really good look at that gun, because when you see the Bisley he came out with, it's not all that different in the in the handle shape, in the right. way it fits your hand. So if you compare a Colt Bisley versus a Ruger Bisley versus the number five, there's differences. Mm -hmm. There's pros, cons. Uh, there's hand size differences. You'll find, uh, you know, you take a take a group of guys like us here, and you know this won't fit everyone's hand. Right. And that tells you why we have different grip frames. So I've, I've sat down with customers and they'll say, I want a number five. And sometimes before they leave on the consultation where we're talking, they have a Bisley. Uh -huh. They have a, uh, a different style, a little different style, but the root of it. That's where it starts. Started right yeah. here. And it's worth noting that this gun was never a safe queen. This was actually a working gun for Elmer. So that holster and that gun were on his hip a lot of the time. And I understand this gun's been refinished once or twice because Elmer just wore the finish off it. Absolutely. So if you'll look, uh, this was a working cowboy gun. Yeah. This was something that he grabbed and uh, dumped into the holster and went to work, grabbed his hat, and it was just another tool in the toolbox. And it's important to, to know that it's, it's history, but this is a, a revolver you can take out and it would be something that I would literally take out, load it up, put the holster on, and I would actually take it and shoot it. It would shoot as well today as it ever did. And so it was a good shooting gun from what I understand. A couple of things that I'd like to point out on this one. We, we touched briefly on the hammer. We touched on the sights. But one of the features of this revolver that I really think it's important that we touch on because uh, the significance of it and how it came about. But if you'll notice, there's this little latch right down here at the bottom that holds the cylinder pin locked mm -hmm. in place. There's actually a notch cut in the cylinder pin that locks into place. And if you've ever gone out to the range and had a cylinder pin back out on you, it doesn't take uh, but just a minute to figure out why this was significant. It just amazes me that in the age that this was built, mm -hmm. that this was something that was a legitimate uh, item for them to build and to come up with. And there's quite a bit of work uh, in building that today. I mean, we've got, we've got milling machines in our facility and pretty high tech equipment. And to set up and cut this notch is, it's a pretty big feat. And like I said earlier, th these guys did it back when the getting was good, you know? Yeah. A lot of handwork in that gun though too. Yes. A lot for sure. of handwork. And that trigger, <clears throat> that is not the normal single action army trigger by uh, any means. No, notice the location of it. It's way in the back. Yeah, it's set back and it's it's basically this was custom designed and built for him. 
for his build, for his comfort. Uh, you know, even you know the sight setup. It, it is a custom built revolver, and it's like having a custom pair of boots. Hmm. It it fits one guy, but you know you grab grab a hole right. and pull them on, and and. Uh, but so, those those adjustable sights were important because you know when he changed a load, he wanted that gun to be dialed into that load. Right which we think of as being normal today, but back in the day on a single action army, that was kind of a luxury. Yeah. It's funny how we keep talking about things as, as unusual for the time, but the more and more you think about how it's for Elmore Keith, it makes sense. Yeah, he's gonna want more accurate sights and a longer sight yeah. radius. Yes, he's gonna want a trigger where he's comfortable. It's supposed to be set to three and a half pounds. Um, even the, the cylinder pin latch, I guess shouldn't, it, it is surprising, but it shouldn't be, I guess, for Omar Keith for how much trouble and how much wildcatting yeah. he did and probably had with those pins. Yeah. Of course he wants one. If he's going to make his own gun, he's going to get a cylinder These were practical like, features. Just, yeah. yeah. And you look at the, the difference in the sights, the difference in the, the base pin. These are things that you encounter on the range, and I know why they did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the leather for this, you know, just just going, going down. Uh, did, did you get a... Look at that. Yeah, it's, that's it's, a number 120, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. That's a beautiful holster. And it's still so, it was so well made, you know, yeah. it's such an amazing It's design, ready to go though. back to work. Yeah. Now he carried this gun until uh till his beloved 44 Magnum came into production, didn't he? Yep, almost 3 so, decades he had this on his hip. Yeah, this was the best thing he could get until uh he had a Smith and Wesson 4-inch 29. And then he carried that every day. So it has been reblued. Yeah. Yeah, man, wouldn't that be something to be, be the guy that got to reblue this one? Oh boy. So we've talked a lot about different features of the gun, but we have not yet. Well, we kind of mentioned he replaced it with a Smith and Wesson uh, with a 44 Magnum, but we haven't talked about the caliber of the number five yet. So this is a 44 special. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as most of you know, it, it was not a 20 yard revolver for Elmer Keith, you know, I mean, it was, it was a shooter to the max. He wasn't shooting factory loads either. No, no. One of the, the significant things to me is the way the caliber markings are marked with the 44 Smith and Wesson and Russian. Uh, it, it's just, it's unique. And it's something that as well as many other things on this revolver has been mimicked. You right. know, and it and it's got some significance, but one of the things that that I'd like to dive into is the engraving. Let's take a look. So uh, it's been brought to my attention, and and uh, so he took this and shot it, and deemed that it was engraving worthy. Okay. And so the the engraving on this revolver was not a cosmetic. Hey, look at me. Uh, I've got an engraved gun. This was a put its working pants on and put its work boots on back in the holster and back to the cowboy. It was a it was a way to hide blemishes, scratches and if you'll look at it it's it's ornately engraved from from head to finish. It even has it's got Elmer Keith's name on the back strap Masonic symbol up on the top strap. I mean there's there's personal there's, there's the location on the bottom on the butt. Absolutely. Turkey, yeah. Oregon. Yeah, the and location. Turkey. Yeah, but it's important that you understand that it's not just engraved for flash. It was engraved for a purpose. Uh, that's that's one one of the things that is important to know. Anything you do, you need to have a purpose behind why you do it. It's such a departure from what we think of today with engraved guns and safe right. queens or. This gun today wouldn't be out of place as a as a barbecue gun. Absolutely I mean, it's got not. Ivory grips. Yeah. It's fully engraved. Yeah. It's uh, you know, there's a yeah. lot going for it. Yeah. But the grips are even carved. You no, know, he got it you all know? for, for I mean, practical reasons. And and uh, here's one more thing that's that's pretty unique. This isn't the first pair of grips that was on this gun. True. And what that tells me is he didn't spend he didn't have a, a ton of excess money at mm -hmm. this time. But what this tells me is this was something he designed. He put his heart into. It was designed for a reason, and he used it. And it just warms my heart to know that somebody would put this much time and effort into a build, throw it in a holster, crawl on the horse, and take off. Well, even the carving, 
according to his original article, had a purpose. It's, it's carved on there just to give a little extra yeah. palm swell. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so it's smooth on the other side, but. Yeah. So really like a lot of firearms, like we talked at the auction house, there's this blended line between art and functional tool and he it's just it. right on the nose. Nailed right it. on the nose. Yeah. But I think his loads for the 44 Special dictated a lot of what went on with this gun because mm -hmm. he had a long range cartridge that could put large game down at distance. Mm -hmm. So we needed good sights. He needed it to be friendly to wear gloves with when he was hunting in the wintertime. He needed something that would handle recoil. Needed a center pin that would come in and out easily so we could fix the gun in the field if he had to. Speaking of gloves, you don't think he would have wanted us handling this with white gloves, do you? I think Sorry, he'd, internet. he'd strike us with lightning if we did that. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you brought up the cartridge again, though, because it's one that's half the story is him experimenting with these loads about you know right. how we can take a jackrabbit at 150 or this was going too fast and so it affected bullet performance in game and, um, and of course today we still have the the 44 Keats special today it's a it's That's a right. Lyman mold that you can go buy you know? it really is and this is why like yep. this is why this thing is significant yeah. the the ramifications for for the custom gun market for uh, for ammunition, it just it's it goes off in so many different ways. I bet there's someone out there somewhere that orders a Keith bullet just because that's what they've been taught to shoot. That honestly doesn't know the back significance yeah. of what that is. They call it a Keith bullet, you know. But you can shoot paper and you can shoot game with it. It does mm -hmm. well on both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who knows how many. Keith bullets, uh, what, 429, 421's the mold number? Yes, sir. Yeah. How many of those went down that tube? Boy, wouldn't it be nice to know. Yeah, it would. And I, I mold them myself and shoot them through my 44s. I've got one of those uh, Lipsy's flat top Bisleys with a four inch barrel. It's kind of, you know, as close as I'm gonna get to that. But it's a, it's a joy to shoot. Well, I think we've gotten all the good we can out of this. Um, Bobby, thank you for your expertise. Thank you for the way you Pleasure, able to honor. Sort that thing out, Absolutely. Joel. Thanks for the history, Good and here. thanks, thanks for you to bring from bringing it over here, from Rock Island Auction House. We really appreciate the loan. It's my understanding there's a you know a few folks here who might appreciate it. Ah, uh, yeah, there certainly are, and thank you very much for watching. If you have any comments, leave them below. We'd like to hear from you. In the meantime, thanks again. We'll see you next time when we bring you another gun from the vault.